Good morning and welcome to D1 Online. My name is Adam Lewis and I'm the pastor at D1 NAS. Today you're going to experience worship, an offering video, and today's message is going to be brought to you by our family ministry team, Pastor Ben Alexander, Pastor Ryan Lutz, and Pastor Kristen Sanders. They begin a sermon series called Family Chat, which is all about building discipleship and teaching within the family unit, which is something that we are very passionate about here at D1 NAS. Don't forget to download the D1 NAS app where you can get up-to-the-minute notifications and you can give online. We hope that you enjoy the service today, and we hope that you're able to worship right there in your homes. Thanks again for joining us today. Let's get ready to worship. Good morning, D1 Naz. Hope you all are doing well. I'm here with my friend Fred Sauerman, and we're going to do some songs for you today. So if you're in your living room or wherever you are, uh, let's go ahead and stand up. Let's sing together. Justice, 
led me out of the desert Only into the streams, river of living water Turned my bitter into sweet And all my burdens are lifted You took the shackles off my feet and there's no sign about it then I got to set free So let So like I said earlier, I'm with my friend Fred Sourman. Uh, he and I have been writing songs together for a long time, since 2004. Yes. Uh, that's when we formed our band, Day 40. And we've done a lot together over the years. Uh, Fred is the technical director over at First Christian Church. And uh, tell you what, he knows his stuff and you guys over there are very lucky to have him. Spoil him and give him everything. <laughs> Because you are lucky to have him. Um, but yeah, I couldn't praise Fred enough. But uh, <clears throat> Fred and I have written a lot of songs together over the years. Um, so the last two songs we're going to do are our songs. Well, this one is kind of our song. Um, it's called Praises Rise. And uh, we took an old hymn, actually, uh, Holy God, We Praise Thy Name, uh, written in the 1700s. I don't remember the year, um, but it was written back in the 1700s. We took it, kind of rewrote it a little bit, added a chorus, um, so it doesn't sound anything like probably the original. Uh, so it is kind of ours, but not ours, but that's the way it goes. So we're going to do this song, it's called Praises Rise, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, once you get the tune, sing along, I think it's pretty easy to catch along too. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Oh, 
Hope you enjoy that last song. We're gonna do one more for you. This one is called Time. This is one of our own songs uh, that we wrote uh, several years ago. And it, it came out of a period of depression in my life. I've kind of dealt with depression on and off and I've had a, a few kind of long periods of it. And out of one of those long periods came this song. Uh, one of the lessons that I learned uh, through that was that Sometimes you just have to give God time. Uh, you know, when you're going through a hard uh, period of life, a lot of times you'll question, you know, you'll ask God why. And I did a lot of asking God why back then. And, uh, and you always hear the term, you know, God's ways are higher than in your ways or that, that he works in mysterious ways. Um, well, when you're in depression, a lot of times that just doesn't help. You just feel helpless, uh, hopeless. Um, but uh, with God and with family and friends, I got through it. And uh, I guess the, the, the best way I can describe depression is you're in a storm, okay? So, you know, your mind, in your mind, you know there's a sun shining, okay? You've had good times in your life. You've had happy times, maybe. And so you know what that's like. You've been there, but now you're in a place where you don't see any happiness. You don't feel any love. Maybe you, you don't feel any connectedness to anyone or, or even God. And so you know there's a sun shining. So you have that logic, but you just don't feel it. And you just don't, 
know when it's ever going to shine again. So it's like you're in a storm. And, uh, but then once I got through it and I could see that sun or I could see the light, I could see the posit positive things coming, um, I realized that God was with me all the way and that I just needed to give him time. And a lot of times God is a little slower than what we like. Um, and, you know, we want things right away. And uh, so that was a lesson that I learned was that you have to give him time. And Pastor has been talking over the past few Sundays about God being there walking you through the trial. Uh, he doesn't promise a life with no pain. Um, you know, if, if you've lived more than one second, you've experienced pain probably because you're crying when you when, when you when you come out. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, so there is pain. He doesn't promise no pain. And uh, and with day forty, one of our kind of our goals has has been always to be. Uh, help those who are new in their faith because we know when you're new in your faith the devil tries to attack you. He doesn't want you gaining, gaining any ground in that area. He doesn't want you building any roots in that area with God. He doesn't want that relationship to form. So when you're, if you're new in your faith out there today, uh, I guarantee you the devil doesn't like it and he's going to do everything he can. Pastor talked about it last week. Um, he is our enemy and he is roaring he is trying to get at us. Uh, he does not like us having a relationship with Jesus. So um, I feel like I'm rambling, but it's just coming to me and I want to share it with you and I hope that's okay. Um, so if you're new in your faith, I want you to be, uh, be encouraged that you can lean on us. You can lean on uh, people in the church. Uh, don't, do not fall away when things get hard because God is with you. And he will see you through. I want to share some scripture here. Uh, it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And He is strong in me. Um, I think that's a goal of mine. Um, and maybe it is for you too. To get to a point in your faith where you delight in trials. Where you kind of look forward to them because you know God is with you. You've been through it before and you know He's gotten you through. Um, but I am never going to ask for <laughs> the trials again. Uh, I learned that when my first time I went through depression. I, I asked God, why, have you, why haven't you tested me this way? And He tested me <laughs> like within a month. And uh, uh, so I don't really ask for the hard things, <laughs> but I know more hard things will come. It's just the way life is. Um, but I like that scripture because um, it's truth. It's truth. Uh, um, when we go through hard times, he, he strengthens us and he gets us through. And, um, and we're stronger at the other side of it. Uh, so we're going to do this song called Time. And, and then after that, we'll be going into uh, the message and other um, messages from the other pastors. So uh, God bless you all. Oh
shines through Looking for the ends Looking for you morning church i'm michael bance the sdmi here at d1 nas uh, i have the opportunity this morning to talk to you about our faithfulness in tithes and offerings um we are called to be obedient to god and to serve him in his kingdom the best way that we can it is it's our job to spread his word and his love for everyone, to everybody that we can. Um, we're to be obedient and to be good servants for him. Um, it's our, also our job to make disciples out of disciples. 
Um, I want to be raw and vulnerable with you this morning and possibly help anyone in their walk with him to know that as long as you're being faithful and you're trusting in him, he will always be there when you need him. Um, prior to coming to D1 NAS, I was not a faithful giver. Um, I didn't tithe every week, sometimes not even once a month. Um, just before we came here, a lot of stuff had changed for me in, in my faith and in my walk. And it grew a lot stronger. Um, and then coming here, being around the people that were here and the generosity that they showed and the love and friendliness that they, that they showed when we first showed up here, um, was overwhelming and he made me see what it was like to be faithful and to be faithful in him and to do what he, what he's, what we're called to do, which is be obedient to him. Um, my wife and I are now faithful givers. Um, and a few weeks ago before all this shelter in place happened, um, we were struggling financially. We were in a bad spot. Uh, my wife was getting ready to pursue a new career and the money wasn't there. We had to pay for upfront schooling and a whole bunch of stuff. We have a budget at our house. We talk about it every week. Um, prior to that, we had tithed the weekend before. We sat down, we knew it was going to be tight. And I'm the person in our, in our house that says it'll all work out. It's all going to work out. I come home couple of nights later and there's a check in the mailbox for over $600 to help us pay our bills and have food. The following Tuesday, there's another check, a bigger one that we've been waiting on. And I believe that that was, that was him rewarding, being able to reward us for our faithfulness. He has a way of showing you to trust him. And if you trust him and are faithful to him, it'll all work out. Church, this is about being faithful to God. It's not about how much money you give, but about giving faithfully every week. That's how your blessing will be received. And because of your faithfulness, your blessings will be multiplied. Um, I want to talk about Malachi uh, chapter 3, verse 10. And this is what it says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the flood, floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. So if you think about that, by giving to his kingdom, he will return in return, give you so much blessing that there won't be enough room to hand, to store it. So let's be faithful, be faithful to him, trust in him and know that by giving to his kingdom, he will in turn give you blessing. So hopefully this helps everybody. Um, thank you guys. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe during this time. And remember that we love everyone. I miss everybody terribly. And I can't wait to see everybody when, Abr whenever this shelter in place is over and we can all come, come back to church and hang out with everybody. We love you. Have a good day. Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Ryan. Welcome back to D1 NAS. I'm joined with two of my coworkers here. We've got Pastor Kristen and Pastor Ben. Hi! <laughs> so glad you're with us. Uh, I am our children's pastor here at D1 NAS. Pastor Kristen, what do you do? I'm the youth and young adult pastor. And Ben does something. What do you do, Ben? Everything else. No, I'm the, the executive pastor. 
So we are, we are a part of uh, what makes up the family ministry team here at D1 NAS. We get a chance to um, join you this morning and talk about families. In fact, we titled this Family Chat, which works perfect because we're going to chat about our families. Um, we're going to, uh, this is a two-part series. The first series today, we're going to talk about you personally, you as a member of your family. This is not just for the parents. This can be parents, teens, children, everybody, grandparents. It's going to be something that incorporates all of us and then Next Sunday, we will start in uh, section number two, and we'll talk more collectively as a whole family. What does this look like? So as we, as we got together and sat down, we thought we would start with what the Bible states, probably a good place to start if we want to be godly families. And we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter six, starting at verse four. I'll read that for us in just a moment, and we'll talk about what that means, and then we'll get into the meat of this. All right, Deuteronomy six, starting at verse number four. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. That is the word of the Lord from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Here is what this is. This is a complete and total declaration from God to his people, those who are following him. He says, I want you to love me, the Lord your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. I want you to love me with everything you have. And then God gives us a little bit of what that looks like. So he gives us two verses. What does that look like? How do we love God with everything we have? Good thing he gives us some clues. He says, I want you to write it on the doorposts of your home. I know in my home growing up, my mom used to print these verses off and she would post them around our house. So on the light switches, when we go to reach for a light switch and you miss, and instead of just hitting the wall, we would clip this piece of paper and the piece of paper would be a verse. This is, this is something sim symbolic of what Christ, of what God wanted us to do when he writes this down. Make sure you post this or you're going to see it and be a part of it. So when God gives us this command, this Shema, this, this plan, of how we should live life as a family, this comes in our everyday lives. So very often we talk about how do we do things as a family? How do we do family devotions? Or how do I, how do I share my faith with my children? So often we try to make this a big event. We try to put a lot of effort into this and think, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not theatrical. I don't, I don't have a deep understanding of the scripture. I can't sit a moment aside in our day of an hour or two where we can sit down and study the scriptures together and sing praises together and we make it this big, massive event in our heads. But really what God is trying to get to us in these couple verses here, he says, this is something simple. This is how we live life. This is how we interact with each other. And this is how God wants to interact with us. So I shared one story of, of growing up, how, how my family would spend time talking about God. Something that I do personally, I try to spend as much time as I possibly can focusing on prayer throughout my day. So I know for me, I've got just a 12 or 10 minute drive up to work in the morning. I don't turn the radio on. I try not to text as much as I possibly can while I drive. Most of the time I do really, really well at that. I spend those few minutes in prayer, in conversation with my father, knowing that whatever's coming today, he already knows what's happening. He's got his hand on it and he's got his hand on me. Spending time in prayer, any, any moment that I can, when something happens and someone sends me a text and I say, I'm gonna pray for that person, I stop everything I can right then and pray and spend time in prayer for that person. But I always start off my prayers thanking God for who he is. Reminding myself every time I start a prayer, thank you God for who you are. It gives, it gives me a sense of reminding who I'm talking to and it's also a way that I can refocus my brain and whatever I'm doing in that moment to remember, you know what, all of this, while it might be important right now, is nothing compared to my importance, the importance of my relationship with Jesus. So we'll pass it off. Mr. Kristen, how do, you, how do you see the Shema in your life? How do you live this out? Well, in preparing for this message, I read the Shema over and over. And as I prayed over it, God reminded me of a verse that's been very transformative in my life. And it's John 3.30. It says, he must become greater and I must become less. So whenever I have felt that my life is getting out of balance, when my heart is not in the right place, it's because loving the Lord my God has become second or third or fourth. It has become unbalanced. And so, and it's made me, I have put myself in a greater position. And so whenever I have desired for myself more, uh, what I want, what I think I need, or what I think I deserve, I feel I'm putting 
God after myself. And that's when my life lacks peace. And so it feels, or my life feels in chaos. It feels overwhelming. Uh, and so to combat that, I have to keep that balance. Uh, and so, and I have to spend time in prayer and I have to spend time in the word. Sometimes that means I'm listening to the Bible read to me as I'm getting ready in the morning. Um, I use the YouVersion Bible app and let it read to me. Um, so, and sometimes it means lying in my bed and listening to the word. When my mind is just going and going and going and I can't get it to stop, it reminds me I'm not put, I'm letting those worries, those things become greater than putting my trust in God and allowing that fear or um, stress to take over me. And so a lot of times I will listen to the word of the Lord and, and sometimes I'll read along with it as it's reading to me, but a lot of times it's just stopping and listening. Um, I have, so one of the things that I did back in 2011, I went to El Salvador on a missions trip and I got to meet my sponsor child. Um, and so I got this small tattoo on my hand uh, as a reminder to that God must be greater and I must become less. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and get tattoos and all that kind of stuff, but it was one of the ways that for myself, that that was my reminder, that every time I look down at my hand, I am reminded that I need to put God first, that he must become greater, that the things in my life that I um, are focusing on, that I may be focusing on, that those things are less, those things need to be second or last, especially compared to God. You know, for me in my house, uh, for, for us, uh, I, I read Deuteron Deuteronomy 6-4, four, four, sorry. <laughs> and uh, the very first thing that, that as I was studying this, the word here is, um, has two meanings within that. Uh, it, it really means reference to your ear and listening. Uh, but actually, one of the other aspects of it and during this, this, this time that the Shema, which means to hear, um, also meant obey, to listen. And for me, when I, when I read this and what I think about my own personal life and the, and the reflection of the Shema is in my listening and hearing God. I, I think a lot of times for me, uh, what can happen is I can hear God, but I still make my own decisions and make my own my own path, which makes me my own God. Uh, within that, it, it creates a, a, a division that I have created between me and God, because I heard his word. I, I want to do his word, but I have acted in the opposite. I didn't know. I didn't obey. I didn't listen to it. Uh, James has a reference to this uh, in one twenty two. It says, do not merely listen to the word uh, or hear the word, but do it. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, and so for me, the, the moments that I, I, I hear it and I listen to it and I, I act on it, um, I draw closer to God. I, I have a desire to even be closer to God. Uh, the moments that uh, I'm doing what, and listening. You know, I look at my kids and they can hear the things that I say. I can let them know, hey, this is the message that I want you to do. I, I ha you have chores. Um, you have structures in front of you and they can go yeah i heard you do that so did you do it no and we have taught i have taught had this discussion with them but the difference between hearing and listening um and i think god has that same kind of interaction with me uh you know i'll, I'll turn to god on a day that i have not been listening and i ask where are these promises why don't I feel you? Why don't I know you? And he turns it right back around and say, you know, I had this word for you and you didn't listen. You heard it, but you didn't listen. And so the Shema for me is more of, I know the commandments and those commandments bring life. Those commandments bring understanding of how I am to live this life. And the moments that I veer from them, I don't have peace. I don't have understanding. I, I live in the world of anxieties and and worries and and frustrations and, and I'm easily angered. Uh, the, my life starts to tumble down a different road when I don't hear and listen. So the Shema for me, when I when I read this, it is an action of me partaking into what God has spoken. And so when I get up in the morning, um, I want to be active in that Shema. 
I want to love God with all my being. And for me, it's almost unbalanced. My life has to become unbalanced. And what I mean by that is, if you read the Shema, it is overbearing of God in your life, an abundance of God. Like if you put it on a scale, it's, it outweighs the other scale of my life, right? And then everything starts to fall into place. You see it through the eyes of God. You see everything through the eyes of God, how you live, how you act, how, what you say, and how you hear things and how you see things is through God, right? Which isn't, which isn't easy <laughs> because then you have to do things and say things and be part of things that are uncomfortable. Uh, but Shema, um, you have to obey. I think there's two meanings for it. You, you can hear it, which is first reference. We can read this and we heard it as, as Pastor uh, Ryan spoke it. But do we, do we do it is the other part of the Shema that a lot of us miss. And we're going to try to discover what that means for us as a family during this next two weeks, too of how to live this out. And Pastor Ryan's gonna give us some examples for children. Yeah, so, so I love what Pastor Ben said there. And, and the word Shema does mean to, to hear or to listen. And it's really interesting that he would say, it's important not just to hear the words and to kind of let them go in one ear and write out the other. It's really, really important that when they come into our brains, when they enter our heads and we're listening, that we're actually living them out. This should be a way of life for us. So uh, kids, let's talk, let me talk with you for just a couple minutes here real quickly. How do we know what Jesus tells us? How do we know what Jesus tells us? I know that you're sitting there in front of a device, if it's a phone, if it's a computer, take just a minute and type something out. Type this or use, some, use those emojis that I know you love. Throw some of those in there. How do we know what Jesus tells us? Because if we're going to live this out, we have to know what he says. So we can read it in our Bibles. We read it just a minute ago in Deuteronomy 6 that we are supposed to live this out. I know for me, as I was when I was growing up, something that was a highlight of my day is we would sit down for just a few minutes at the end of our day, and one of my parents would open up a devotion Bible, and sometimes, sometimes my sister or I could be the one to read out of our devotions. And that was always, that was always a highlight when we got a chance to sit down. And if my sister and I sometimes would fight over it, which was maybe not the best way, but it was awesome because if we got to be the ones to actually sit down and open that devotion Bible book, whatever it looked like, and to be the one to read it, that was really, really exciting. Okay. So I'm seeing some comments coming in here, which is awesome. Here's a couple ways that we came up with number one, which you, I'm sure you put up there already. I might've missed it coming by. Maybe Make sure that you are reading your Bible. That is the number one thing. If we want to know what Jesus wants from us, it's written down. Thankfully, he gave us this incredible book right here that we can look through. It's full of incredible stuff that God wants us to understand. Number one is read our Bible. Number two, number two is just as, if not more important, we can pray. We can pray. We actually have the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with the person, with the God who put all of this together in front of us. We have an opportunity to talk with him every single moment of our days. Just a couple minutes ago, I shared that I have quiet time throughout my day. Sometimes I have to be really, really intentional. I have to make quiet time. I have to shut the radio off. I have to put my phone down. I have to make sure the TV's not on. And I spend just a couple minutes every so often talking to God. And part of that talking involves me listening, listening to see what God is saying back to me. I'm really, really good at talking. Ask any of my friends. Actually, don't because they're probably just still listening because I talk so much. But how often do you spend just listening? So those two things, those two aspects, kids, are two areas that you can really focus on. That just you personally, without anybody else, you can spend time reading your Bible and you can spend time talking to the God who created you, the God who loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you. Those two simple things can begin to, to grow that relationship with Jesus so that we can take steps closer to him as he continues to take steps closer to us. So that's kids. That's a couple ways you can, you can grow closer to Christ and you can follow the Shema. You can listen and act it out. Pastor Kristen, how about some teens? How can we do that? Well, obviously what Pastor Ryan was saying about reading your Bible and praying, those are important, not just as kids and not just as teens, but for all of us. So I'm going to build on that a little bit. And so what I want you to do first is I want you to ask the question of yourself, 
when you're at school or in sports or extracurriculars, and I know right now we're in quarantine and that's not always, you know, the case, you're not, but this is not going to be forever. You're going to be back in sports. You're going to be in extracurriculars. You're going to be able to see people face to face, but do your friends, do your classmates, do they know that you love Jesus? Are you afraid to talk about him? I want you to be thinking about that. Because back when I was in fifth grade, which I know I'm a little older than a lot of you, um, we had these things that were cool. It was the WWJD bracelets. And they were called, you know, it's, that meant what, did you, what would Jesus do? And I thought just by wearing that bracelet, oh, everybody has to know that I'm a Christian. Everybody has to know that I love Jesus. So I don't have to say anything. I just have to wear my bracelet because everybody will know. But it was a cool thing. A lot of people, kids didn't even know what it meant and they were wearing them. So how did that make me different? Well, so that's one thing that I want you to challenge for yourself. I want you to ask yourself, am I talking to my friends? Do my friends know that Jesus is important in my life? Do they know that Jesus is the most important thing in my life? And if they don't, then I need you to, to be praying, praying and saying, okay, God, what am I putting before you that sh that's out of place what do I need to be doing or what what areas in my life have become more important than you than you I think about video games I know a lot of you love video games are is that something that you love more than Jesus television do you care more about what your friends think than what Jesus thinks so a lot of during that prayer time during that that time of reading your Bible, a lot of it is self-examination of knowing and asking God, what areas of my life are out of balance? What areas of my life am I putting friends or video games or other things in front of you? And so in order to move forward in your relationship with Jesus, you have to, you have to identify some of those things. And it can't just be, oh, well, I wear this bracelet or well, they should know I go to church. So therefore, you know, it, the number one thing that I have found that opens the door towards sharing your faith is just asking people if you can pray for them or how you can pray for them. It opens the door. And so my challenge to you this week is to message your friends, one or two even, and just say, how can I be praying for you? And they, and try to make it people that don't know you go to church or they don't necessarily agree with you in your faith and I know you might be like oh I don't I don't know that I want to share my faith because what if they ask me a question that I don't know well then you do what we do we say I don't know but I don't know but we'll find out that's the best answer you can give I don't know but we'll find out and then you have access to everything that we have access to as pastors the word that's where we get our answers. And so if you, so you have the same opportunity that we do. So I second what Pastor Ryan said, read your Bible, spend time in prayer, but ask people, ask people how you can be praying for them and reevaluate what areas of your life are out of balance and what, what are you putting before God in that time with God? Go ahead, Pastor Ben, tell us what, what we can do, what parents can do. Well, uh, you know, I, I want you to understand where we're coming from right now. I know we haven't really, we've kind of talked about the family structure, but what, what I think the focus for us uh, today with the family chat is to understand if God is to be in the family, he first has to be in you, the individual, not just parents, not just teenagers, not just kids, but whoever is listening right now, God is in the center of your life. And if you want him to be in the center of your family, that has to start there first in your life. And when that, what that means to me is uh, what these, fa these amazing words that Jesus said in Mark 12. He was uh, uh, sitting with a bunch of people and having a lot of questions thrown his way. And a question was asked to him, what is the greatest commandment? And he answers with the Shema, which is awesome, right? It's Mark 12, 29. The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. This is no commandment greater than these. Okay, so there you go. This is where we start. 
So you got to ask yourself, am I loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength? All those things right there is where we start with all this. And it starts right here personally. So if I want to see God move in my family, if I want to see God take control of the, the chaos maybe that's going on, you ha he has to start here. The moment that God starts, we start allowing God to use these things, my heart, my mind, my soul, my, my strength, guess what starts happening? Reconciliation. We start seeing our family through God's eyes. And we listen and we obey. That is what the Shema is. These are great words by Jesus. And we thank you for being with us. Join us next week as we um, focus on what this means as a community, what, we, what this means corporately. So I'm going to pray over you um, before, we, before we send us out. Um, if you'll bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for giving us your word so that we know how to live it out. So we know how to share it with others. Father, I pray over each family, over each individual, uh, each couple, every single person that is watching this. Father, I pray, I pray so much that you would become the center of each of their individual lives and each in the center of each of their families. God, we love you. We thank you so much for you. We thank you so much for your Holy Spirit that you come in and you intervene in our lives. God, we love you, we praise you, and we give everything, everything over to you. Amen. 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 Hey, leave comments down below of uh, in ways that you personally, you know, involve God in your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Love you guys. See you next week. Hey, everybody, what a great day of worship it has been. I want to say thank you to Jim Wilkerson uh, for um, leading us into the presence of God through worship. And I want to say thank you to Pastor Ben, Pastor Ryan, and Pastor Kristen for that awesome challenge today uh, as we move forward and think about the future, which is the, the purpose of this video. Before we get to that, I want to share a few verses of scripture with you. It comes from Psalm 121, verses 1 through 2. And it says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. If you listen to Christian radio, those words sound very familiar because they are in a, a song of some kind. Uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, 18 years old, uh, a good friend of mine and I decided that we were going to drive from Lima, Ohio, where we lived, to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, Fort Wayne was not that far away from where we lived. It was only about 45 minutes, and it was a much better town than the town we lived in. I know that I tell people that I grew up in Gomer, Ohio, which I did, but just for the sake of um, not sounding like a, a goober, uh, I tell people that I'm actually from Lima, Ohio, which was the nearest big city. Uh, and yes, that is the same name as the Bean. And in case you're wondering, the town mascot was this giant lima bean. I tell people I'm from Lima, Ohio. So it's not much better than Gomer, but it is what it is. It wasn't that far from Lima, Ohio to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so I showed up at his house uh, early on a Saturday morning and we got in his car and we drove across the Indiana border, headed to Fort Wayne. And right when we got past the Indiana border, his car died. And this is the days before everybody was carrying cell phones. In fact, in that day, if you had a cell phone, it was in one of those zip cases that was in the console of your car and it plugged into your cigarette lighter and it was like $5 per minute. You know, it was one of those Zach Morris shoe phones. I mean, that's what, that's what people had. And we did not have one of those. And so we're out there in this flat land right across the border of Indiana. There are a whole bunch of cars going by on this highway, but there are no houses in sight, and we really, truly didn't know what to do. We thought that somebody would maybe stop and help us, but you know, two 18-year-old guys standing out there against the side of, a, of like a Dodge Omni or whatever we were driving didn't look very safe. And you know, seriously, would you have stopped? We probably would not have. So we stood out there for almost two hours, 
And we had nobody to call. We had nowhere to walk. Uh, our, our best hope was to flag somebody down, but that didn't necessarily feel the safest. We found ourselves in this extremely hopeful, hopeless sorry, situation. When we looked over down the road just a few miles, um, and what we started to see come toward us was a flatbed tow truck. And we thought, there, that is, that's it. That's our chance right now. So we started waving our arms and flagging this guy down. And this guy driving this tow truck pulled over and he said, where do you guys need to be? And we said, we're actually from Ohio. Can you help us get back to Ohio? And he loaded up our car and he drove us all the way back to my friend's house in Lima, Ohio. That was our only hope. We didn't have any other hope. And I wonder if that's the same thing that the writer of Psalm 21, 121 was, was experiencing as well. He says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That very first verse indicates that he was looking around on his level, looking around at other people. And there was nobody. Where is my help going to come from? I mean, I'm looking all around. I, I, don't, I don't know where my help is going to come from. So I look up. I look toward the hills. That's where my help is going to come from. It comes from the Lord who, and then he puts the nature of God around it in that second verse. He says, the maker of heaven and earth. See, I look around at all these people and I say, well, can this person help me? Probably not because they didn't make heaven and earth. Can that person help me? Can this family member help me? Probably not because they didn't make heaven and earth. So I look to the one who did make heaven and earth. That's where my hope comes from. And that's where my help comes from. You know, these days, where does our help come from? It has to come from the Lord. And we are praying to God about so many different things uh, more intensely from the health of those that we know and love, the health and the safety and the healing of those that we don't know, We're praying for the economy. We're praying for our jobs. We're praying for our church. We're praying for our children. We're praying that this is a time of awakening for people who don't necessarily uh, consider being a Jesus follower a priority. That's where our help comes from. And that's who we as D1 as leadership are looking to now more than ever these days. Our eyes are so solely focused on Jesus and our ears are tuned in to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. We want to operate in wisdom more than any other time uh, because as the days go on, we really don't know what to do. And in a way, that's a good thing because that makes us rely on God even more. In other ways, it can be kind of a scary thing, which faith is kind of scary sometimes. We have talked about a reopening plan, but it, of course, will go in line with what our governor has instituted. And whether or not Illinois is in phase one, phase two, or phase three. Now we know that when they lift the shelter in place policy, it's not going to be everybody busting out of their front door and getting back to life as normal. They're going to allow smaller groups to get together, smaller pockets. And so we have plans for if our leadership allows groups of 10, groups of 50, and groups of 100. We have plans for each one of those things. When the shelter in place policy begins to lift, and they allow, let's say, groups of 10. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to bring the worship band back and we're going to record from right here uh, at D1 NAS. And we can, if, if we're able to, we're going to encourage people. If social distancing has been eased up on a little bit to have house church mornings where they invite people over to their homes and they watch the service. If social distancing is still very strictly enforced, then we probably can't do that. But again, we'll know when the time comes and we'll make that decision. If they allow groups of 50, then what we'll do is the worship team and myself will come back to D1 NAS and we will record from here. We will open up the doors of the church And here are a few things that you've got to know uh, that we're not going to have when we open up the doors to the church. At first, uh, we're going to do a thorough cleaning of the entire building. We're going to have sanitation stations available. We won't have any door greeters. We won't be passing the offering plates. 
We won't have any coffee or pastries or anything like that. We won't have kids ministry. And we'll have three places that are open. The Grove, the Fireside Room, and the Great Room. And everybody will have to stay at least six feet apart when we open the doors back up. We want to begin putting together the structure for house churches. Uh, And again, when social distancing is starting to be lifted a little bit, we will encourage people to go over to the homes of some of our leaders and have church right there, right at their kitchen table or right there in their living room as they watch our service, maybe have breakfast or lunch together and um, walk through the Bible study of what the sermon was about that day. But again, we'll have to wait until all of those things uh, are put into place by our government. We do want to get back to worshiping together, but we also want to keep in mind the safety of our people and making sure that we are staying safe, staying distant from one another for this time as the curve starts to flatten. We're also understanding two things, Um, and again, I'm I'm recording this on a Thursday, and all of this may be irrelevant by tomorrow. I don't know. But the health professionals in our country are talking about another wave of it happening in the fall. And so we have to think about that and anticipate that and take that to the Lord in prayer. The other thing that we might hear maybe tomorrow, maybe today, it may be Monday, is that our governor may... uh, Uh, put into place the shelter-in-place policy for longer, possibly the entire month of May. And if that's the case, then we have to adjust. So we just want to let you know that D1 NAS leadership is thinking and praying about every possible way that we can get back to worshiping right here at the church. And we're also thinking about ways that we can keep you connected. The drive-by hellos will continue. Of course, we want to continue to pray for people in our community and those that are going through health issues. And, and you know, stay connected to us through Facebook and through text messaging and the phone. You can do that. Uh, we, we as a staff have been on the phone calling a few people every day trying to make sure that they're okay. And of course, we have to make sure that the discipline of giving continues So that when all of this is done, we can get back to the ministry that we believe God has put in place for the year. We cannot wait until we get back together. I saw a poll earlier this week. In fact, I shared it on my Facebook page that um, people have said even more than restaurants, schools, and businesses that they want churches to open up the most. Because it's within that church community that they get this sense of hope. They get a sense of strength, not just from God, but from being in the presence of God of other people who, as it says in the book of Acts, have everything in common, and that everything is the one thing, and that is Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for D1 Online, and we will see you again this week through Facebook Live. Stay in contact with us as we continue to pray for you. God bless you.